Weapons can be beautiful. More effort goes into designing them than peace lovers might like to admit, and swords are no exception. In fact, swords can have some very curious designs. These are the 20 most unusual swords that have actually been used in combat. Number 20. Urumi Sword Someone notify Indiana Jones, we found a sword that acts like a whip. The Urumi is a type of weapon with a flexible structure like a whip native to South Asia. Originating in what is now South India and Sri Lanka, it's believed to have existed as early as the Maurya dynasty between 320 and 185 BC. It is considered one of the most difficult weapons to master due to the risk of self-injury. This weapon is treated like a steel whip and therefore requires prior knowledge. For this reason, Urumi is always taught in the final stages of South Asian martial arts such as Kalari Peyatu. In principle, it's a sword that behaves like a whip and a whip that cuts like a sword. Therefore, a very difficult weapon to control since a warrior needs to be an expert to master both techniques. Mastering the sword and whip requires many years of strenuous effort. The Arumi, if you don't know how to use it, is a dangerous weapon not only for the opponent but also for the one who wields it. You can lose an ear or a nose in the slightest carelessness. Many experts consider the Arumi to be the deadliest swords ever created. Like this video, smash the subscribe button and click the notification bell right now or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Now, it's time for the odd topic. There are a lot of unusual swords in the world, but this one has got to be the most unusual we've ever seen, which is why it's crazy to learn that it was used in the Second World War. The sword was used in the early days of the war, but quickly fell out of favor when it became clear that guns were the way forward. As always, let us know your thoughts in the comments section down below using the hashtag odd topic. Number 19. Te Tawana, Gilbert Islands Kiribati, formerly known as the Gilbert Islands, is a small expanse of islands and atolls in the vast central Pacific Ocean that make up what is now the Republic of Kiribati. This isolated group of islands is home to one of the most unique and curiously armored and armed infantry forces in the history of warfare. The Kiribati developed a distinct warrior culture using rare but effective materials to wage war, with weapons and armor forged from raw materials available on the islands and from the sea, combining the two for a unique approach approach to weapons and armor. Their long sticks or spear weapons are forged from palm trees. They were long, utilitarian weapons, but not particularly sturdy. When longer weapons were broken in combat, shorter melee weapons such as the Tatooinia or Tembo were wielded. Some of the spears must have required immense strength and dexterity to wield at close to 18 feet in length. The ends of these weapons, including spears, swords, tridents, daggers, and clubs, were embedded with dozens of shark teeth woven from palm fiber and human hair, the latter for ceremonial purposes. There are even vintage examples of coconut bandages woven from shark teeth that were tied around the knuckles for close combat. Another commonly depicted weapon was the three-pronged Tato Manaria. This long, trident-like weapon allowed the wielder to push or disarm the enemy to a comfortable distance from the opponent. Number 18. Clay Wong, Malaysia. Meet the horrifying bladed weapon between a sword and a machete. The fearsome Klee Wong is found in Indonesia and Malaysia. This weapon features a single edge blade with a protruding notch near its tip. You could say this weapon is halfway between a Golok and the Kampilan. Indonesia being such a culturally rich country, the Klee Wong varies greatly between the various cultures on the islands. The blades range from 15 to 30 inches in length and may be straight or slightly curved like a scimitar. The Klee Wong is mainly carried for show by followers of chiefs or taken on expeditions to the market, even maybe to nightly walks in the villages. Most people wear them without a sheath, although there are sheathed varieties. These weapons are extremely effective in close quarters combat, as the Ache War proved to us. The Klewang wielding soldiers did very well against the saber-wielding Dutch troops and the Royal Netherlands East Indies Army. Eventually, the Dutch also developed their own Klewang at the end of the 19th century, because firearms and traditional swords weren't always reliable at all all times, especially in the jungle. A Klee Wong in the right hand never refuses, they said. Number 17. Panabas, Philippines. 
This elegant and unique weapon, also known as Nawi, is a large, forward-curved sword, or better yet, a battle axe. Panabas are used by certain ethnic groups in southern Philippines. They can range from 2 to 4 feet in length. One particularity that makes them great weapons for close quarter combat is that they can be held by one or both hands at the same time, which delivers a deep, meat cleaver-like cut. Scary, right? Back in the day, Panabas were used as combat weapons, as execution tools, and as a display of strength and power. But a blade is a blade, and some people did use them occasionally as an agricultural and butchering tool, too. The name itself is a shortening of the word pang tabas, which means for chopping. The Nawi is one of the most recognizable among Filipino blades weapons. The forward curving profile makes it unique not only in terms of appearance and aesthetic, but also in terms of handling. It's used in a chopping rather than a thrusting motion, therefore the shape of the actual tip varies quite a bit. Then there's the hilt, which stands out due to its length in comparison with the blade. The hilt is usually made out of hard wood such as nera and often wrapped in rattan. Number 16. The Roman Gladius, most of the known world. Gladius is a Latin term used to designate a sword, which is applied in a modern way to the weapon used by the legions of ancient Rome from the 2nd century BCE through the 2nd century CE, approximately. It had an estimated length of half a meter, although they could be made to measure for the user, and a straight and wide, double-edged blade. From this word derives the term gladiator that we all know so well. Roman soldiers were practical when it came to killing their enemies, and sinking the tip of the gladius sword five centimeters into the body of the opponent was enough to knock them down. These weapons were used both by Celts and Celtiberians, very practical for initiative attacks since being short and light, they could launch an attack very quickly, especially lunges for which they had a long point. They could also be used by slashing, which often didn't help much since the enemy could wear a coat of mail, but in the event they had to take a cut, they were double-edged. The original Hispanic swords were measured for each person and made of high-quality iron, which was treated in a special way, resulting in very good weapons. It's considered by many to be the best sword that's ever existed from a practical and strategic point of view, and the one that caused the most deaths in ancient times. Number 15. Hook Sword they're also known as twin hooks, tiger heads, or tiger blades, and they're basically three weapons in one. Efficient, right? They consist of a long pole with a hook at the end, an arced blade above the fist, and a spearhead beneath the handle. There are few less lethal weapons than this one. Traditionally, these weapons are associated with northern styles of Chinese martial arts, but nowadays they're often used by southern styles as well. Most antique examples and artistic depictions of the hook sword are from the late Qing Chinese dynasty or later, which was established in 1636. Modern routines for tiger blades are often very flashy and spectacular. They may involve techniques such as linking paired weapons and wielding them as a single, long, flexible weapon. In China, these amazing weapons are also known as Qian Kun Ri Yu Dao, which translates to Heaven and Earth Sun Moon Sword. It sounds very poetic and gorgeous, but this weapon is everything but that. It's a lethal, dangerous, and powerful sword that should never be used by anyone other than an expert. They are highly effective in combat, but a warrior needs extensive training to be able to use one. For this reason, they fell out of use in actual warfare. Number 14. The Katana, Japan this sword needs no introduction. It is one of the most famous and recognizable swords in the world. It's a curved sword with a single edge and a pointed tip, traditionally used by the samurai. Its size is around a meter in length, and it weighs about a kilo. Due to the curved nature of its blade and its unique edge, the katana is considered a saber. As such, it's more slash-oriented than thrust-oriented. Its unique curvature isn't due to the fact that the weapon's been conceived this way since its creation, but is due to changes in the steel at the time of cooling it in water with special salts. That is, during the hardening process, the steel blade is covered with clay and coal dust. When the blade is removed from the forge, it has a temperature of 800 degrees Celsius. The very fine layer of clay on the edge cools quickly, which gives it its exceptional sharpness, and this is contrary to the body of the weapon, which is covered by a thicker layer of clay, which makes it cool slowly while retaining greater ductility. The structural changes that take place during the cooling process curve the katana to give it its characteristic shape. The katana was mainly used for cutting, and due to its ability to produce very severe wounds, it was considered a kind of hand guillotine. It's unsheathed with an axial rotation movement bringing the edge up, and it can be wielded with one or two hands, the latter being the traditional modality. Number 13. 
the Miao Dao China. This blade is also known as Chang Dao, which literally means long knife. It was a type of anti-cavalry sword used in China during the Ming Dynasty from 1368 to 1644 AD. Sometimes called the Miao Dao, its blade closely resembles a Japanese odachi. This weapon was adopted by General Shi Jiguang, who acquired a Kage Ryu manual received by Japanese pirates, or Woku, where he studied and modified it for his troops, using it against enemies on the Mongolian border in 1560. It Placed the Jan Madao as a weapon to loose horses. In General Xi's time, it was 1.95 meters long in total, with a very long handle, apparently a little more than a third of its total length, and its curve is deeper than that of Japanese swords. Commanding up to 100,000 soldiers on the Mongol frontier, General Xi saw the effectiveness of the weapon, to the point that 40% of his troops owned a Chang Dao. However, this weapon is rarely practiced in modern Chinese martial arts, and only a few schools train with it today. Number 12. Nulu Congo This unique and extravagant weapon is an execution sword used by the Bantu peoples of the Congo Basin in Africa. In a way, it resembles the Kopesh, the sickle sword of ancient Egypt. Except the Nulu has a far more massive blade made of iron with a non-cutting back and a semicircular concavity. The intricate handle is often surrounded by metal wire and ends with two large wooden buttons and a smaller one. This weapon could have used one or two blades, and it was mainly used for capital executions by beheading, as in cutting someone's head clean off. The way they did this was to sit down the condemned with their head extended and attached to a branch. Yet yeah, this blade's history isn't a pretty one. When the Nulu has two blades, the shape is reminiscent of a man with his arms extended towards the sky. Kind of ironic, considering what it was used for. When the Belgians invaded and colonized Congo, the Nulu beheading was forbidden. That's when the weapon, deprived of its function, took an even stronger symbolic ceremonial value. During the 20th century, the Nulu was worn during the Likbeti, a ritual dance in which, at the end of the ceremony, the weapon is used to decapitate a goat. The goat is then consumed by the entire tribe. Number 11. Zweihander or Bidenhander Sword the Zweihander is a great sword used mainly in the Renaissance period. Although it was already used in Germany in the 14th century, it gained notoriety during the 16th century as the weapon used by the German Lance Knets of Emperor Maximilian I. Presumably, they were used in the first line of formation of the Lance Knets to open gaps between the spears of the pikemen, whose pikes were fearsome weapons for both normal infantry and cavalry. Perhaps the best known Zweihander user is Pierre Gerloff Stonia, whose skill, strength, and efficiency with this sword were renowned. He even managed to decapitate several people with a single blow. His Zweihander has been on display in a Frisian museum since 2008. It is 213 centimeters long and weighs approximately 6.6 .6 kilograms. The Zweihander could be up to 180 centimeters long from the base of the pommel to the tip of the blade, with a 120 to 150 centimeter blade and a 30 to 45 centimeter hilt. The weight could range from 2 to 3.2 kilograms. On the blade, just at the top of the guard, the hooks that acted as a second guard were between 10 and 20 centimeters away from the hilt. This defense, like the guard, prevented the enemy's blade from sliding down, damaging the user's hand. Number 10. The Kilich Turkey in Arabic, it's known as Saif, in Turkey as Kilij, in Morocco as Nimcha, in Mughal, India as Tulwar, and in Afghanistan as Pulwar. They are all scimitars. The word scimitar was used for all oriental blades that were curved compared to the straighter, double-edged European swords of the time. The main cuts of the scimitar were the cut and slash using the upper third of the blade. Blades with a greater curvature had a greater slashing effect, causing mutilating wounds that had a detrimental effect on the morale of opposing troops. The Yelman added weight to the tip to give it greater momentum when swung. This weapon is a feat of design. For some, it's the only sword that could rival the almost perfect Japanese katana. The killage was used by the Ottoman Turks, and it was later adopted by none other than Vlad the Impaler, who not only inspired the legend of the first vampire for his bloodthirstiness and utter cruelty, but he was also the last line of defense between the Turks and Western Europe. The killage's tip is extremely sharp for stabbing, but due to its unique design, it has to stab diagonally. This necessitates for an outstanding fighting style that can go around shields and can be a lot harder to block from swinging stabs. This weapon is also a great decapitator. Number 9. Kalis Philippines 
A kales is a type of double-edged Philippine sword, often with a wavy section similar to a Javanese keras. Like the keras, the kales's double-edged blade can be used for both cutting and thrusting, except the kales is much larger than most keras, making it a sword instead of a dagger. It's said that the wavy part of the kales is meant to facilitate easier cutting in battle. Since a straight edge tends to get stuck in the opponent's bones, the wavy part allows the wearer of the kales to more easily draw the weapon from the body of the opponent. Uh, yeah gnarly, but efficient. This weapon is basically designed to be able to stab as many people as possible with the least effort possible. A true feat of military engineering. The Kalis's predecessor, the Karis, is said to have first appeared in the 13th century, originating from the Indonesian island of Java. From there, the Karis migrated to the Philippines, where it evolved into the Kalis. All Filipino types of Kalis swords are larger and heavier than those from Indonesia. Although considered a slashing weapon, the Kalis can be used effectively for thrusts and stabs. The larger Kalis was introduced to Indonesia, especially Kalimantan and Sulawesi, where it's known as the Sundang, Sandang, or Karis Sulu. Number 8. Shotel, Ethiopia this curious-looking weapon originates from northern Ethiopia. It has an almost semi-circular blade, and it's flat and double-edged with a diamond cross-section. The blade is about 40 inches in length, and the hilt is a simple wooden or rhinoceros hornpiece with no guard. This gorgeous sword was often carried in a close-fitting leather scabbard, which was decorated in precious metals and always worn on the right side of the warrior. Ethiopia has a long history of blade making. In fact, the oldest known primitive stone tools first appeared in the Gona and Omo basins in what is now Ethiopia about 2.5 million years ago. They were usually made by cracking stones to create a sharp-edged flake. The shuttle's exquisite design is proof of the region's expertise in weapon making. Its semicircular shape was very effective when it came to reach around an opponent's shield and stab them in vital areas of the body, such as the kidneys or the lungs. The shuttle's upper edge was unsharpened and often braced against the swordsman's shield for strength. The shuttle's techniques, amongst others, included hook attacks against un mounted and dismounted opponents that had devastating effect, especially against mounted cavalry. This weapon could be used to hook and tear the warrior off the horse. Classically, the shuttle was used dismounted to hook the opponent when reaching for a shield or any other defensive weapon or implement. Number 7. Kopesh, Egypt Kopesh is a sword or saber with a curved blade in the shape of a sickle with the edge in its convex part. This sword was also called Kafresh. Kopesh was introduced by the Canaanite Semitic peoples who settled in the Middle East after their wars in Egypt. The Kopesh was developed from the axes used in war, which makes it not a true sword that grew from daggers, but a specialized axe. Unlike a true sword, the Kopesh does not produce deep cuts, but slashes. This sword has certain characteristics more typical of the axe than of the sword. It's a weapon with many variants in its morphology, from the versions with a concave blade and external edge to its final versions in a more recognizable form as a short saber. There are also smaller copies that lack guard hilts and served efficiently in their time given the type of defensive weapons, armor, and shields it was up against. However, its value lies in the mass that it used at the time of slashing, and this is a characteristic that every family of sabers inherited. Therefore, the cutting power of these original swords was due more by the use of their weight than by their razor-sharp edge. Edge. Said weight was accumulated at the point of impact on the edge of the weapon instead of near the grip, giving a more powerful cut. Number 6. The Jian China the Jian sword is the quintessential straight-bladed cold weapon of the Chinese people. Moderately long, double-edged, and practically without a cross, it has been used historically since the second millennium BC. The Jian are wielded with one hand, but two-handed versions do exist. It is one of the four great weapons of Chinese martial arts. The Chinese Jian sword, according to many specialists, has its origins or was already widely used in the Zhou Dynasty 1050 to 256 BC, and it seems that its decline began in the the third century of our era. Its development was analogous to that of bronze metallurgy, so the Jian swords were gaining length, hardness, and flexibility, even being carried out in two-handed versions before our era around the third century BC, a feat not seen in the West until well into the metallurgy of steel in Europe. China has been, for millennia, one of the cultures that has made the best and greatest use of bronze. This was undoubtedly the reason why their bladed weapons continued to be made with alloys in which bronze was predominant, even though iron 
Western was known. The reason for this was his ability to make bimetal weapons. Chinese metallurgy achieved as early as the 2nd millennium BC to combine alloys, mainly bronze and iron, to make weapons. This made their swords and sabers hard on their edges and flexible on their central veins. They even added a bath of chrome oxide as a finish to give it an anti-corrosive layer. Number 5. Flame-Bladed Sword now, you can't deny that this sword looks cool as heck. Look at it, it looks like a silver flame. And actually, this was exactly the idea behind the design of the flame-bladed sword, also known as wave-bladed sword. The dents on the blade can appear parallel or in a zigzag fashion. Flame-bladed sword is an umbrella term that includes many different types of swords. It's certainly not exclusive to a particular country or region. The two most famous ones are the rapier or espada ropera from medieval Spain and the Zweihanders from medieval Germany. But this weapon's design isn't just to look amazing, it was also done to cause unpleasant vibrations while parrying. Aside from that, though, the undulating blade isn't much more effective at cutting than a conventional straight one. However, a waved blade could better distribute the force of impact and therefore was a lot less likely to break in battle, which was a huge advantage for the warriors of those times. These types of weapons were used during the 16th century in Germany only by well-trained and very experienced swordsmen, usually for single fights. Number 4. Falcata the falcata is a type of edged weapon, an iron sword originating in Iberia in relation to the indigenous Iberian populations prior to the Roman conquest, and which was widely used among the Iberian peoples, the Celtiberians, and the Carthaginians who had conquered much of the peninsula. It was a very common sword in the more Celtic area of the Iberic Peninsula, which is modern-day Portugal and Spain. The term falcata does not come from antiquity. It seems to have been forged by Fernando Fulgosio in 1872, after the Latin expression ensis falcata sickle-shaped sword, which, however, designates the harp. It's assumed that he chose falcata rather than falcatus because the Spanish word for sword, espada, is feminine, although other assumptions can be made. The name caught on very quickly and is now firmly established in scholarly literature. Falcata-shaped swords derive from Iron Age sickle-shaped knives. This also explains their ritual use. Historians believe that it was the Celts who introduced it to the Iberian Peninsula and who spread iron technology. It seems that the falcata has a pair parallel origin to the Greek copus and not that it is derived from it. Number 3. Bowie Knife Bowie knife designates in the United States in a generic way defense and hunting knives rustic and large, generally with long blades above 25 centimeters, and a wide clip point type with a non-cylindrical handle used in the borders of the United States since the mid-18th century. Basically, this knife is the symbol of the Far West era. The name that popularized them came long after their general use, with a duel that occurred on September 19, 1827 on the Vidalia Beach on the Mississippi River near the city of Natchez, Louisiana. The event was named the Sand Bar fight. The main protagonist, James Bowie, a slave trader and adventurer of great social prestige at the time, had a close fight with several contenders. Even after being hit by pistol shots, he managed to kill Commander Norris White, his enemy, who had given him a rapier blow to the chest with one blow from his big knife. Bowie survived this fight to die years later in the epic Battle of the Alamo in 1836 in Mexico. This and other famous events featuring these knives, narrated by the pioneers and settlers of the North American West, definitively associated these knives with the conquest of the Old West, indelibly connecting them to American culture and later spread worldwide. Number 2. Honda Sword the Khanda is a double-edged straight sword originating from the Indian subcontinent. The Rajput warrior clans revered the Khanda as a weapon of great prestige. It often appears in religious iconography, theater, and art depicting the ancient history of India. It's a common weapon in Indian martial arts. Khanda appears often in Sikh, Jain, Buddhist, and Hindu scriptures and art. The word Khanda originates from the Sanskrit Kagda from the root Khand, meaning to break, divide, cut, destroy, and it's the oldest word for a bladed weapon. The term is used in the Rig Veda in reference to an early form of sword or sacrificial knife or dagger to be used in war. The blade flares from the hilt to the tip, which is usually quite dull. While both edges are sharp, one side usually has a buttress plate running most of the length, adding weight to the downward cuts and allowing the wearer to place their hand on the silver edge. The hilt has a large plate guard and a wide finger guard connected to the pommel. The pommel is round and flat with a spike protruding from its center. The smash can be used offensively 
directly or as a grab when executing a two-handed strike. The earliest swords appear in the archaeological record of ritual copper swords at Fatagar in northern India and at Kalur in southern India. Straight swords have been used in Indian history since the Iron Age Mahajanapadas, approximately 600 to 300 BCE. Number 1. Dufikar also known as Zu al Fakar, Du al Fakar, Dul Fakar, or Dul Fakar, is the sword of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Historically, it was often depicted as a scissor like double bladed sword on Muslim flags and is commonly shown in Shia descriptions of Ali and in the form of jewelry that doubles as talismans, such as a two pronged scimitar. Middle Eastern weapons are often inscribed with a citation mentioning the Dufakar, and Middle Eastern swords are sometimes made with a forked point in reference to the weapon. The meaning of the name is uncertain. The word du means processor or master. As for the meaning of fakar, it means divider, differentiator. The word fakar has the meaning of the vertebrae of the back, which could be referenced as the one that cuts the vertebra, the one that splits the spinal column. The name may also be a reference to the stars of Orion's belt, emphasizing the celestial origin of the sword. Legend has it, Muhammad himself asked God to give him a sword after a ruthless battle. The Dufakar then appeared in his hands, and he threw it to Ali to replace his own sword, which, after having cut into the helmet and shield of the strongest Meccan warrior, shattered his own sword in the same blow. As you can see, by looking into the history of old weapons, one can learn a lot about the region's history, ideologies, and customs. What about you? Which one of these amazing swords is your absolute favorite and why? Tell us about it. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time.